Some small man visited my room last night and said he was here to take me away. I looked up from my cereal, frowning, and regarded Elsie with my most deadpan expression, the light of my life and my one and only daughter. She laughed, and her teeth flashed white innocently. It had to be make-believe something, I decided, and offered her a smile instead, asking, And what sort of man was in your room, and where is he taking you? Elsie went ahead and poured herself a bowl of frosted crunchies, a few clattering out and bouncing onto the countertop. Um, about yay high, she says, holding out flattened hands about waist high. And he had a really odd-looking face. I frowned in confusion. You haven't yet answered my first question, Elsie. Where is it that he wants to take you? Elsie thought for a moment. I half expected her to say something like, Neverland, from the Jamie Hook book she had read and loved, or maybe even Mount Liberty, after she and I had watched that Hitchcock North by Northwest movie I had rented from the video rental last month. Christ, what had I been thinking, letting her watch that? Elsie's response took me by surprise, and I had to ask, Where are you going with him? How do you know he'll take you? It must have shown on my face, because I found myself worrying that the great Elsie Stewart's imagination may be waning at the age of seven, and in only 2016. Well, I said, mustering a grin. You just get him to have this man come by one more time while I'm at work, and when I get home, I'll make sure he talks to you and tells you what you want to know. I need you to tell me exactly where he wants to take you. You don't want to miss dinner, do you? I'm cooking steak tonight. Then her eyes lit up, and that smile I'd seen too many times to count over the years spread across her face like wildfire. With a cry of delight, she jumped to her feet and threw her little arms around my waist, burying her cheek into my stomach. Wow, I said with a laugh, as best as I could returning the hug in my standing position. I love you, Dad, she said softly. I chuckled, feeling a spreading warmth throughout my chest, that pulsing warmth that only a daughter can give. I knelt, and as was our morning ritual, she leaned forward and gave me a quick kiss on the cheek. I rose and buckled on my gun belt, dropping my Colt Peacekeeper revolver into its holster before turning to leave for work. When I came home later that evening, I found Elsie in her usual place, sitting on the floor in her room, drawing. I could hear my heavy footfalls echo in the modest apartment as I entered and dropped down on the bed next to her. She didn't look up from the drawing as she absently said, Hi, Daddy. I walked up behind her, ducked and put my hands on my knees as I peered at what she was doing. Hey there, what you drawing, sweetie? I asked, and she popped to her feet, turned around to face me, and grinned, clearly delighted. Jamailed it she said proudly, presenting her latest drawing to me. In the image, the person was the ugliest I think I'd ever seen, even in a drawing. The head was horribly misshapen, with bulging black eyes that looked like huge billiard balls nearly set into the misshapen skull. The mouth was little more than a straight line, deeply carved into the wrinkled face. I frowned, troubled by the darkness of my daughter's creation. Lydia, what is this? I asked, trying to keep the chastisement from my voice. It's the man with the funny face, she said happily. I thought about our little game from yesterday morning and felt a little better as I offered her a smile as well. Suppose you tell me, I asked him, did this man come to see you when I was away? She frowned before replying, no, he did not visit me. Well, that's too bad, I said, feeling disappointed. I was almost glad to think that our little game was over. That thing Elsie had drawn had been too unsettling and too terrifying to think of it as anything in my house. I would make sure that she stayed away from those horror comic books. They were obviously fouling her mind. The night came and went, and once again, the first thing Elsie said when she came down in the morning was, A little man came into my room last night and said he's going to carry me away. I frowned slightly. Wasn't he just here last night? I asked. Well, yeah, but he said it again tonight, she replied, seating herself and taking a peach from the bowl in the center of the table. Like every morning, my day was inaugurated with a little kiss on the cheek 
and then it was just the same old heading off to work, coming back and making some dinner, then enjoying some Twilight Zone rerun with Elsie and hitting the hay. I still couldn't sleep. Whenever I drifted towards it, visions of the face in Elsie's drawing crowded my thoughts, and I opened my eyes to it in frustration. I was a bit of a loss of what to do, but I found myself in need of activity, and I shuffled into Elsie's room. She was in a deep slumber, breathing heavy. Standing by her window, I verified that the latch was locked tightly. This way, at least I knew nothing could get in or out. The other doors and windows in my house were all locked, and I felt much better about it all. I got back into bed and slept soundly for the remainder of the night. The next morning, it happened again. But when she said the words this time, I found myself cringing inside, even though I tried to hide it. A small man came to my room last night and told me he is going to carry me away. Babe, I choked, my voice breaking. Do you think we could maybe not play this game anymore? Elsie looked at me quizzically. What do you mean, Daddy? Hey, Elsie, you know there's no man in your room, don't you? Elsie just shook her head very slowly and kept her face blank. Elsie, it sounds to me like you're having a... Ah, uh, what is the word? A repeating nightmare. It is a type of dream that happens again and again. It is not dangerous, I think. Elsie's eyes were cold and empty as she said, Daddy, I'm not fibbing. A real man is coming to get me. I set my breakfast down for a moment and thought about it. A thought came to me suddenly, and I hid a smile that threatened the corners of my lips behind my glass of orange juice before clearing my throat and speaking. Elsie, can you tell this man something for me? Uh-huh, Elsie said, buttering her toast. Tell him he's not welcome in my home any longer. If he wants to take some, let him take the Carter kids from down the road. Elsie's eyes flickered with a brief hint of amusement for one second. She was well aware of the reputation the Carters had, and how glad most folks would be if they just disappeared one day with no one around to ask questions. Yes, Daddy, I'll tell him. A couple hours later, as I was finishing up for the day and preparing for bed, I walked to the nightstand and reached into the drawer, retrieving the revolver. The leather of the holster was still supple and unmarred. I'd taken good care of it. I removed the weapon from its keep and looked down at the shiny metal of the lethal piece of hardware. In all my years on the force in Riverton, Virginia, I hadn't fired it except for once or twice when I had to unholster it. Just like I never got that bump to detective, no matter how much I busted my ass and gave them everything they wanted. I feel my anger flare a little. It's not fair for my boss to block my lifelong dream just because I didn't smile the right way at his wife. What's his deal? I push away the anger, reminding myself not to resent my boss, that it will only lead to more regrets. I was so determined that when I arrived home and ended up on a bed, I had to place the gun beside me on the nightstand. I know some people would tick me off, but I wouldn't have been able to sleep without it in reach last night. Everything was fine when I awoke this morning, and at least I knew that I was able to sleep uninterrupted. I chuckled to myself as I looked at the gun laying beside my bed as then, but that's how I decided to do it. Standing up, I retrieved it and went into the kitchen and made some oatmeal. Before I had been sitting at the table, eating my breakfast. I don't even notice that Elsie hasn't made her way down for her morning breakfast until I'm halfway through mine. Elsie, I shouted, come breakfast, I have make oatmeal. It was odd that Elsie hadn't said anything because she loved oatmeal. I stood up and walked uneasily past the stairs in the open doorway of the living room. I took a deep breath and moved through the kitchen and den, carefully climbing the steps one at a time before turning around on the landing and looking at the hall. The door to Elsie's room was partially ajar and I could see that one and only other lavender painted wall that I had painted myself, just as Elsie had requested. I wished I had my pistol. My mind struggled to conjure all the strange and terrible things that might be waiting on the other side of that door, possibly even now, within it, terrifying my daughter to frozen silence. I thought of the picture Elsie had showed me. Something deep inside me warned against it, told me that if I swung the door open all the way, the thing would be there in the shadows, 
waiting for me, ready to spring and maybe tear my throat out with those sharp white teeth hidden so well within its mouth. Then my brain said, Hey, dumbass, you're out of your mind. There ain't a blessed thing in that room except your two grown daughter. Now get your ass over there and open the door. My chest grew tight with the same feeling you'd get if the cogs and springs of a clock were suddenly wound to their fullest tension, and I moved cautiously toward the door until I stood right in front of it. Placing my fingertips on the smooth surface of the wood, I pushed carefully and it began to swing inward with a terrible grating sound that set my fists to clenching and my teeth to grinding. I flicked the switch and the light came on. I didn't see Elsie. The sheets on the bed were all tangled and twisted as if there had been some sort of a struggle. I suddenly realized that I was holding my breath as I looked around the room. Ten gouges stretched a full ten feet along the wood beside the bed, looking for all the world like someone had been taken by the ankles from their slumber and dragged from the bed. Then, I took another step and peered down at the thing on the floor, and a very real fear, a deep fear of a very personal nature, shot through me. I think it was a fingernail, a woman's, if I had to guess, and no bigger than a sleeping pill. There was some blood then, and the trail led to the open second-story window, where the trail would stop. A chill stirred in the area, and my tear-blurred vision looked left and felt my knees give out as I fell to the floor. I wept there, sobbing uncontrollably with my heart absolutely breaking for the loss of my little girl. How could I have not seen it? That little man with the strange face that had been coming into her room every night was probably some kidnapper who had taken her and I hadn't even realized it. Me, a cop. And now my little girl was gone. She was taken. But from where? How? All the doors and windows had been locked from the inside. I felt a cold bolt of ice lance through my chest. It didn't make any sense. How was this possible? What happened? Those were the thoughts that tumbled over one another in my mind. There was only one thing for it. I got to it. I took a look around and decided to start in Elsie's room, but not before I'd gone down to the storeroom and grabbed my Nikon from my case in the basement. I snapped pictures of every inch of the room and all of the evidence I could find, even taking a shot at an out-of-place fingernail on the floor. It looked to me like Elsie had managed to fend off her attacker at least momentarily and it looked like the last tug backwards had bent the nail back before it finally snapped free, left the evidence where it might fall. And letting one of them get ripped off by a door is abso fucking lootly criminal, I tell you. Didn't I tell you about when I was 12 and had to pull that big-ass toenail off my foot that had grown all fucked up into the front of my shoes and was infected? You have to, or it'll never grow back. It's too much pressure, see? Well, I dreamt or if I tell the truth, hallucinated, that it broke and was drifting inside my sock. I went to the head and found myself a good-sized pair of rock hammer and pliers, but I couldn't find my hat or shades when I came where I remembered leaving them between the double. So I guess that was all some aftercare hangover from the few days I'd been a good boy and a patient, then getting back to thumped whenever it looked like I was going to wake him. I guess the memory of that first week of pain was something, and I'm all fucked up. Anyway, where was I? Why hadn't I heard her scream? In such brutal pain, she would have been screaming, unless... unless the son of a bitch was covering her mouth. But that didn't make any sense. If I had seen something reach up and grab her feet and pull her down away from me, then how was she... unless it had more than two arms? I shrugged. I had one more idea. I ran back down to the first floor and grabbed what I needed from my work drawer, where they'd sat, again, in expectation of a detective job that never came. I picked them up on eBay. I headed back upstairs and started pulling fingerprints. I think I searched every square inch of that bedroom, from the window to the bedposts. I didn't find anything. A frown grew on my face when I realized that every fingerprint I had recovered was from Elsie. I scowled to myself and shook my head. How stupid was I to think, even for a moment, 
that whoever or whatever was capable of snatching a child from their parents' grasp would be leaving fingerprints all around, and with a shout of irritation, I threw the brush across the room. What now? I thought I'd check out the roof and see if it gave me any clues to what the hell was going on here. I fumbled my way out of the second-story window and staggered into the slanted roof of my house. Where I was, the first thing I saw was the stack of missing shingles. They lay upon the roof at my feet, and I could see others strung from there in a path to where I was standing, and the very edge of the roof, looking down, I could see the top of the arbor I had built to support the grapevines that grew along our porch, giving folks that stood upon them a ready foothold to jump up on the roof without any trouble at all. I frowned, considering the fact that they were still, after all, on the wrong side of a locked downstairs window. I crawled back into the house through my window and resolved to follow this new trail. Hopefully it would give me some insight as to where my daughter was being kept, assuming she was even still alive. Once again, that fishhook feeling in my gut returned, and more hot tears flowed over my now weather-beaten cheeks. I couldn't allow myself to even consider the possibility of losing my only daughter. Wasn't it my wife and son that I had lost? I remember the last time I laid eyes on my wife. It was that Wednesday morning when she told me she was going to pick up some groceries. I kissed her goodbye that day, and it was the last time I ever saw her. I did find out later that she had gone to Georgia and married some businessman there. Sometimes you gotta just put your face in your hands a while and decide what you did wrong in the process. After you cried all the tears you could cry, and you couldn't think of any logical explanation for how fucked the whole thing was. There wasn't really anything else you could do other than just continue on like it never happened. After my wife had left, I was left with my and Elsie's ten-year-old son, Jeremy. Jeremy was with his friend, Sammy Johnson, down at the river. Richie had wagered Jeremy three shiny silver dollars that he couldn't swim out to the sandbar in the middle of the river and back. Jeremy didn't know how to swim at all, but he decided to take a chance. The money was too good. He was drowned fast. I didn't see any reason to have Elsie at the funeral. It was just another way for something to bother her, so I kept her home. She was only three, and I don't think she had the ability to really understand what was happening, but I erred on the side of caution for her mental state. That day, at the service for my son, when I stood there and watched his body, I made a promise to myself. I swore that I wouldn't lose Elsie, like I had Helen and Jeremy. I promised myself that I would keep her close and safe and away from any hint of danger. Did I maybe overprotect her from time to time? Sure, I think it's a fair statement, but it was a price I was willing to pay to keep my baby safe, so sue me. And here I was. Elsie had been taken, and God knows, maybe killed, and I couldn't even muster the fortitude to stand my ass up and face it like a man. I couldn't think that Elsie was dead. She wasn't. She had to be alive, even if she wasn't doing so great at the moment. I had to get to her. The one with the gun belt comes next, and I'm out the front door before I even realize that I'm moving, with a fresh surge of hatred at the damned arbor formerly gracing my entryway. Setting out along board the edge of my property, I don't even know where I'm searched for, but there has to be something here that tell me where Elsie is when I get to the edge of my yard and find it. It was a torn scrap of pink pajama material. The first thing I noticed was the tree line in front of me. The tree line that I had told Elsie never to go past. I pushed my way through the waist-high grasses and brambles and trees and moss and whatever other shit was down there and unsteadily found myself descending into the dark shadows of the forest and was forced to hunch over and walk with my eyes fixed on the ground. I'm able to pick my way through the forest, from clue to clue, but it is difficult, and more than once I think that I must be going the wrong way. I don't have any other choice, though. Here's a distorted footprint there, a bit of blood on a leaf here, a broken twig every now and then. I should see about getting my hands on some bloodhounds, I think. I'll have to put in a request at the station. I figured I'd call it in as a kidnapping at the station when I got back, but only if I couldn't find out anything further on my own. 
I noticed one more footprint that was perfectly visible, but it looked like it was disturbed, changed. It was sort of bent in shape, almost curved, and it had three toes instead of the usual five. I figured it was just from some sort of altercation that had taken place more recently and snapped a picture of it with my Nikon before moving on. I spent another hour following the signs along the trail, entering further into the wilds, and whenever I began to doubt myself, another memory would spark to life and help keep my resolve. I was ten when my dad took me hunting in the woods for the first time. I had been looking forward to it for a long time. He outfitted me in heavy camos, so many layers that I felt like a sausage, and gave me a twenty-two rifle, showing me the basics of gun safety. I had to strain to hear him through my cap, pulled down hard over my ears, but it was fine. I'd shot with the friends before at their houses and already knew all this. And then we were moving. Together, we walked into the thick trees, looking for an elk to shoot. I asked if he wanted me to take the cap from it, and he agreed with a nod. I had barely taken it from the rifle when he raised his hand. He crouched down and studied the grouchy patches of mud intently and beckoned me over. I bent down beside him, resting the rifle's butt on the ground as we both examined the deer track he pointed to. Then he showed me the basics of tracking in a low whisper. At first, I was quite bad at hunting. But as the years went on, and I spent more and more time in the woods with my father, I became much more proficient at it. By the time I was a teenager, I was one of the best trackers in our little village, with some guidance from my father. I smile at the memory, even now in my predicament. A few minutes later, the woods end abruptly, and the trail with it. I'm looking out over Carter's cornfield. The wind stirs the pale yellow cornstalks, taunting me. Without a doubt, the abductor brought Elsie this way, through the cornfield, but I can't just go tromping around willy-nilly and investigating anything I like. As a police officer, I don't have the jurisdiction to search the Carter's property without a warrant, and if I'm caught on the property, I could be shot by Bart Carter himself. The man was pretty well known for taking a shotgun to trespassers. But I remember being called out to the Riverton police station when a boy, maybe nine years old, came in bawling his eyes out. It took me an hour to calm him down enough where he could try and tell us what happened to him. He'd been chased away at the point of a muzzle loader from the Carter property where he'd lost his baseball. This, I'm afraid, is what people mostly think of when they think of the Carters. Wait a minute. How do I know the Carters didn't take Elsie? I mean, I don't really know the Carters, but for some reason, the thought bothers me. The only thing I knew for sure was that the family had a bad habit of raising troublemaking children, and the father had been popped for poaching more than once. That's about the extent of it. The family members were not known for their amicable nature, and it was generally best to keep clear of them altogether. The answer was in those cornrows. So I didn't really think about it too much. I just kept moving forward, passing more of the yellowed rows. The trail through the cornfield was easier to follow than in the forest. The broken stalks were a broad and visual path. The sun was getting high in the sky, and my forehead started to bead with sweat. I kept moving, hearing the dry sound of corn husks cracking under my shoes and the stalks moving against my arms and legs. I keep expecting to see Bart Carter in front of me, along with the muzzle of his eight-gauge shotgun. For some reason, though, it never happens. The farm is still and peaceful, and no gunfire startles me, and I'm not spilling my guts all over the place. I keep walking along the cornfield. After a bit, the trail opens up into a clearing, but it's still the cornfield around me. The wording is fine, it doesn't need any changes. The stalks were flat in a twenty-foot circle around where I stood, and I could see no sign of Elsie anywhere around me. It looked like the earth had just swallowed her and her kidnapper whole, leaving a very noticeable area of open ground in its wake. I couldn't find anything else after a thorough search. I needed to do something. I needed to reach out to my fellow officers and coordinate a full investigation at the Carter farm. That's what I should do, right? And then I began to think. I sat down in the large area of cornfield clearing and thought. I'd been busting my ass in the Riverton Police Department for years, 
and I was still waiting on that promotion to detective. I'd known since leaving college that I wanted to start out as a cop and work my way up to being a detective. I'd been doing a pretty damn good job at it too, but hadn't been able to catch the break. If I could solve this case on my own, without help from anyone else, then my boss would have to give me that promotion, even if he didn't like me very much. What could he say? That said, I needed to find Elsie, and I needed to find her fast. On my way back to the house, I formulated a plan. I was going to head back out to the Carter farm that night for some stakeout photography. At exactly 10 o'clock, when the sun has just set beyond the far horizon, I step out of my house. I leave my car on the ledge that looks out over the Carter farm and sit and wait. I'm not finding anything out here, nothing at all. I begin to entertain the moronic notion of heading home, having dinner, and sleep the night away at home. Maybe in the morning, I'll call for more departmental assistance. The despair threatens to overwhelm me. What does it matter if I don't make detective? What difference does it make? I certainly have no chance of finding Elsie out here on my own, realistically. I'm just wasting time and could be putting Elsie at greater risk by not notifying the rest of the police department that she's missing. What if they took my badge for not reporting a felony? What if Elsie was already dead? If I didn't just call the department, there was a chance it could mean the difference between life and death right now. I couldn't just stand here and do nothing. I had to... What? I didn't know. I just had to... Something. If I don't see anything in the next five minutes, I'm getting the hell out of here and calling the department. I look at my watch. 2.37 a.m. exactly. I let out a long breath and a wave of fatigue floods over me. Blinking quickly, trying to keep my eyes on point, spots flicking my vision and even the most minor of movements feel as if I'm forcing them. My eyes close heavily for a moment and I enjoy the feeling of sweet sleep that passes, not quite falling asleep, just resting for a moment. I am awakened by a bright flash of light and I can only gape in wonder at the incredible and beautiful sight that I am witnessing. An enormous white sphere appeared from nowhere, drifting lazily downward through the sky, spinning very quickly and sending hundreds of jagged flashes and shards of every possible hue, some of which I don't even think my brain could recognize or identify, searing and burning into the startled crops. I could feel the waves of it pulsing all around me, and then it made a rustling sound as it settled through the stalks and dropped into the Carter cornfield, flattening a great expanse of the greens immediately, without any more warning. I stood where I was, unable to do much more than stare, transfixed. This could not be real. It was something unnatural, and I could feel the tingling it gave my skin, my hair standing on end along my neck and arms. And then the thought occurs to me. This is alien. I just watched a UFO touch down on Earth. I can't even process it. Is it possible that I'm the first person to ever see this? That's when I sense it. Bubbling up from some lost place, an inexplicable need flows through me and insists that I step out of my car and into this coalescing storm. Come into the light, Scott, and I'll show you your daughter. Step out of the car and walk to the light. There you will find every earthly pleasure you've ever known. Just take that step. I started and looked around the car, sure there was someone else here with me. Then I realized the voice wasn't mine, and it wasn't real. It felt like someone was jamming his thoughts into my head by force, like subliminal messages. Go towards the light, Scott. But the voice. That's not possible. It can't be. And it sounds so real, so soothing. My hand is about to reach out and grasp the lock on the car door, but I stop it, my eyes closing tightly, trying to block out the cacophony of voices in my thoughts. I know how the tailor got into Elsie's room at this very moment. She let him in. I also understand why I didn't encounter old man Carter or any of his family when I was in his cornfield. They were going towards the light. Just step forward into the light, Scott. I feel my blood racing as I fight a mental battle that I know I can't win. Scott, you cannot fight it. Come out into the light. For long, terrible moments I struggle with an errant thought. One that could result in my maiming 
or my death, or worse. They've taken Elsie. What was I thinking, obeying anything these soulless bastards? Elsie can only be released if you come to us, Scott, if you join us. I could see that they would not let Elsie go while I still stood here. Suddenly, I was keenly aware of my predicament. My mind raced to figure out a way to evade them, but I was unable to think of one. Whether it was something they were doing to my thoughts or simply the immediacy of it, I don't know. But somehow I couldn't imagine any other choice but the one they offered. Scott, you need to step into the light. After only a moment's hesitation, my hand moves to the lock again, this time at my own volition and not at the behest of whatever things inhabit the light. I pull the car door open and step out, slowly making my way along the ledge and making use of every second of freedom I can. This isn't something I want to do, but I have to do it. For Elsie. And then I'm taking another step. Ducking my head slightly, I stumble forward and through the cornfield, keeping my eyes on the dancing light. It's like it's drawing my subconsciously, more than anything else, and before I even know it, I'm running through the corn and coming upon the source of the light. The light is very bright here, and for a moment, for a split second, I'm too scared to open my eyes to it. Then I realize that I only have a second before it all goes to hell, and I open my eyes, fully expecting a fatal burst of it in my face. I'm acutely surprised to find that the white sphere is moving, shimmering within a foot or so in front of me, and I can feel the ground shaking beneath me. I shout with all my might, calling Elsie's name. I can make out the shape of her small form spilling out of the light, and for a moment, it almost looks as if it were somehow stuck to her skin, like a liquid, until she pulls completely clear of it. I stand up slowly, searching the woods frantically for any sign of her, barely able to breathe. Elsie! I cry again, and then she's there, running at me with open arms. I gather her up and just hold her against me with tears streaming down my face. Elsie! I cry, wrapping my arms around her and burying my face in her shoulder, sobbing. Elsie wraps her arms around me desperately, as if I were the last person on the planet, holding me even tighter than before. I can feel her shaking all over a bit, almost like from cold. I start to rub her back comfortingly. Dad! She chokes the words out. Dad, you have to go back. They did horrible things to me. I almost died. I don't want you to die like I did. For a moment... I consider taking off running with Elsie in my arms, away from this approaching danger. Why should I just sit here and listen to these things bullshit? I grip Elsie a little tighter, and without realizing it, I almost reach for the pistol on my hip. How did I not think to use that? The voice in my head returns again, just a little menacing this time. Scott, it is pointless to make this more difficult than it needs to be. We will not allow you or Elsie to leave here alive if you do anything foolish. Gritting my teeth and clenching a fist upon it, I lowered Elsie to the unsteady boot and met her gaze with a complete lack of will. I had promised myself I would keep her with me, and my chest ached and my throat tightened at the memory of that promise. It was with great difficulty that I spoke to her then, keeping my gaze locked with hers. Elsie, forget it. Just get the hell out of here and get help, okay? There's a cell phone in my car. Call the police, okay? You know the number? Tears are running down her cheeks now, and her voice is thick and laden with sorrow as she sobs. Daddy, please don't do this to me. Please, I can't go on without you. I reach up and use my thumb to take away her tears, telling her, Please don't cry, Elsie. I don't like it when you cry. You know as long as you're safe, I'm safe, right? It was a lie, and we both knew it, but Elsie only nodded, and her weeping continued. I laid Elsie gently on the ground. Her breath came ragged and heavy. I met her blue eyes for a long moment, watching the play of multi-hued lights in her pupils, and then with a feeling of heartbreak, I screamed as loud as I could. Run, Elsie! Get to the car! I point her off in the direction I mean, and then rise and turn to the light. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. At least Elsie is safe. I step into the light, 